before I chime in here, what are your thoughts? And I know we might have a couple of people from overseas, so you know, if you think that we Americans are lazy, I'll take no offense, but just throw out some numbers here. What do you think, the average American, how many hours a day are we working in an eight hour day? What, what would you think? Six, all right, a good optimist. Four, it's going down. Usually there's a couple twos out there. Um, well, that's actually, and that's actually what Bob said. He said it was two. Now, please don't go around quoting that as some verified statistic. I may have remembered this number wrong. Uh, Bob may have not had those numbers correct in the first place. But I just remember at the time, it struck me, whether it was two or three, it was very, very low. And I wanted to know, what are people doing with the other six hours of the day? And uh, as it turns out, sleeping is a pretty popular activity. Sometimes facing uh, up like this, uh, sometimes facing down on our desk and drooling. Um, also very popular is making funny images with Photoshop, kind of like this one here. Uh, or this one. Now this is actually me wasting time on Photoshop, which is why it's probably not as funny as the first image. That's my son. Uh, I think that was his first bath. It didn't go well. But now for those of you who think that we're torturing the little lad, this is him just a couple months later, loving bathing, eating soap bubbles. Um, now so the, the point of all this is not that I have a cute son. It's that as leaders, you know, we can create and sustain uh, cultures in our workplaces that attract and retain very, very talented people and ensure that those people are fully engaged while they're on our team and not messing around with Photoshop. So what I'd like to do with the short time that we have together here this afternoon in beautiful Chicago is share a few ideas based on my experience and some of the best workplaces in the world that can help us to create and sustain that type of culture that not only attracts and retains talented people and ensures that they're engaged, but is also really the essence of delivering high levels of customer service and boosting innovation. Now, all the ideas that I want to share are based on just one simple shift in our approach to how we interact with people, and most specifically, how we lead. And I did not discover the power of this shift as the result of some great success that I had somewhere. I actually discovered the power of this shift as the result of the greatest failure of my life. So I'd like to start with that. Um, this is about uh, 20 years ago almost now at this point. I was just out of college, a couple years out of college. And for some reason, I convinced myself that I should take a shortcut to success. And I partially attempted a fraud against the United States government. And as a result of being both stupid and doing several dishonest things, I ended up spending five and a half years confined to prison. And the first year of it uh, was in what essentially amounted to solitary confinement. I spent approximately 22 hours per day alone in a cell that looked almost exactly like that. A six foot by nine foot, about the size of probably most of your closets in your bedrooms. And maybe smaller, actually. Um, now, as you would imagine, you know, this was by far the worst experience of my life at that point. I went through every negative emotion that you could possibly imagine. It was mostly anger directed at myself. I was extremely angry at myself for being so stupid. At that point, I thought I had thrown my whole life away, and I caused tremendous suffering for the people around me, specifically my family. Uh, and it was a good week or so, almost two weeks, where I was so depressed about the situation that I had suicidal thoughts just flashing through my mind. And it was one particular day, it was very intense, where I almost tried to hurt myself. I never actually did, but got very close. And you know, as, as terrible as it was, um, over some time I started to adjust, and this situation actually ended up becoming the best thing that ever happened to me. And again, I would say by far. So very fortunately for me, about a year into my time of being confined, um, I started learning about this very simple practice called mindfulness training, which is just a, a pretty straightforward and simple way of training the mind to be more self-aware and to eventually become very free from our thinking. And after about six months of engaging in this practice, pretty diligently, I'm kind of type A, when I do something I, I go all at it, and after about six months I noticed that I was actually happier right there in a prison with nothing than I'd ever been in my entire life. And I had been learning about this practice from books that were written by monastics and everything that these monks had written about and I had uh, verified through my own experience up to that point, it gave me a lot of faith that this practice is worth something. So I decided to just go as deep as I could. I ended up spending the last three and a half years of my time in confinement living and training exactly as monks live and train. So I was spending hours and hours every day training my mind formally. And then after leaving confinement, um, I went to go live in a, in a real monastery, 
And actually, after being there for about six weeks, I told the monks, I want to do this. I want to be a monk for the rest of my life. And I, so I almost, I almost ordained uh, sh with the shaved head and everything forever. But I realized that I thought I would actually be more able to serve the people around me um, if I was out here with you all and not in a monastery someplace. And so those were the two big shifts that occurred as a result of this experience. So one, as I mentioned, was I learned that we don't actually need anything external to ourselves to be happy. That is something that can be trained just by working with our own minds. But perhaps more importantly was that I learned that, and many of you probably know this, and we'll come back to this later, but you know, a life that's really worth living, a life that's really fulfilling is one that's devoted to being of service to the people around us, to being helpful, to taking care of others. And that's what the monastic ideal is entirely about. It's about giving up our short-term self-interest so that we can be of greater service to others. Uh, so with this uh, you know, aspiration to serve, as many people who have this aspiration born within them, the first thing that I did was uh, get involved in the nonprofit world and co-founded and, and led a couple small nonprofits. The second one that I, that I founded was the Florida chapter of an organization that's now international called Kids Kicking Cancer. So although I was the, the founder and, and ran the, uh, that chapter, the, for the first year I also taught almost all the classes. So it was, it was a pretty busy time, but it was an incredibly rewarding time. I got to work with amazing young heroes like these guys who had just the most devastating diagnoses you can get, like cancer or sickle cell anemia or cystic fibrosis. And what we were teaching these young heroes is that they can actually lower their own pain levels. You know, just by tapping into their own inner power. So we're teaching mindfulness and other growth tools through the, through the martial arts. And just by tapping into their own inner power, using what we call the secrets of the martial arts, they can lower their own pain levels. Now everything that we're teaching is backed with plenty of research to demonstrate its effectiveness. And in fact, we had young people who could, in a matter of minutes, they could lower their pain levels from a 9 out of 10 on a pain scale down to a 2 or a 3 out of 10. And we didn't even have to be in the room with them. They could do this completely on their own. So in many cases, what they're doing is more effective than morphine. I may have misspoke. I think I said that we were teaching them things. Have any of you worked uh, with a population like this of very sick young people? Uh, I don't see anyone with the, uh, one person, yes. And those of you who haven't, I'm sure you could intuit this. Most of the time, I wasn't teaching them. They, they were teaching me. This is the most inspiring and wisest, I dare say, group of human beings I've ever had the privilege of working with. Well, while on this, um, I guess we could say it's an uncommon journey. I don't think it's totally unique. Uh, I would say that without any doubt, the, the biggest takeaway for me has been that the more focused I've become on what I can do to be of service to others, um, the, the happier I've become for one, and the more success I've had by just about every metric that you can measure success by. And, and after some time, I was reflecting on this, and I was thinking about um, how team members seem to be more engaged the more that I took care of them. And I, this question started coming up over and over again. You know, I wonder what would happen if for-profit companies ran like this? You know, what if, as a, the core operating uh, or the core leadership philosophy of a for-profit business was based around this idea of, hey, let's, let's put taking care of our team members and serving them as a, as a place that is a higher priority than we do some numbers on a spreadsheet, like expenses or, or quarterly profits. You know, and I think intuitively, we, we all get this, right? If we really take care of team members, what happens? These people come in, they're much more engaged. Uh, that results in better customer service, better product development. Um, it's better cultures for innovation, ultimately in a better bottom line. But I don't like to just rest on you know, intuition. So I started diving in and doing a bunch of research on this topic. And I found company after company after company that demonstrates that over the long term, if we do in fact prioritize serving and taking care of our team members, prioritizing their long-term well-being over our short-term quarterly profits, the balance sheet looks and the profit and the P&L looks very, very good over the long term. So uh, with, after doing this for, uh, speaking on this topic for about five years, um, you know, going out and trying to inspire leaders of organizations to not, not only connect the dots and realize, that, wow, if I, if I come to work with the primary motivation of serving and caring for, our for my team members, that's really good for business outcomes, 
but also it makes work more fun. It makes it very enjoyable to get up and go to work in the morning. So for the last five years, that's principally what I've done, is go around and speak at different events and try to inspire leaders to make these connections and also provide practical tools for doing this at a very high level. But I have something that uh, some of you might be able to relate to if you um, have just this itch to build things. It's called founderitis in the startup world. But I just love to build things and get people smarter than me to run it and then go build something else. And uh, so after speaking on this, I, I really wanted to do it myself. <laughs> So in the fall of last year, I started a company called The Generous Group. Um, we're a marketing agency, and of course, just like any other company, we, we really prioritize delivering a great ROI for our customers. But the, that's not why we exist. The, the main reason that we exist is to create a workplace culture where people are thriving. You know, pro, I would dare say that over half of the workplaces in our country, in the United States, are actually making people sick. You know, they're, they're toxic enough, people are anxious enough, Anxiety and stress is the number one by proxy cause of death in the United States. So our workplaces are literally killing people. And you know, with, at the baseline motivation, I said, well, let's see how we can create workplaces where people, their, their well-being is not adversely affected. Maybe even a step above that where it's a neutral effect, where they're either, it's neither adverse or positive. But let's see if we can go even further than that. Let's see if we can build a workplace culture where people's well-being their physical well-being, their emotional well-being, perhaps even spiritual well-being, just how we develop as human beings, are all actually enhanced as a result of coming to work. So our number one aspiration is to build a culture like that, to build a culture that is perhaps the best place to work in the world. Um, and the, the core reason we want to do that is not because I know that it's very good for business, but because I just imagine for a second the effects on society if every company was run like that. You know, if, if when everyone went to work on a Monday, they were looking forward to it, right? And when they came home, they were refreshed, they were happy, they treated their husbands better or their wives better, their children better, their neighbors better. I actually think that we as business leaders can take very, very significant steps toward creating a culture of world peace by how we manage our workplace cultures. Now, I would, we're very new, so I, I, again, I, one of the motivations other than contributing to world peace is to create hopefully the best case study out there of just how good this is for business so that we can inspire other leaders to do the same. Now, because we're less than a year old, I don't have any data that I would even dare share with you at this point. There's nothing conclusive. So what I'd like to do is share with you some of the case studies that inspired me to do this in the first place. Um, perhaps the most well-known case study, which I'm sure many of you are aware of, uh, Southwest Airlines. So are any of you Southwest uh, fans by chance besides me? Oh, almost everyone. Great. <laughs> Well, one of the, as I'm sure many of you are aware, one of the most interesting things that Southwest did, um, they were not the first company to do this, but they were among the first to, to state boldly to the public that their shareholders are not their top priority. And for those of us who all just raised our hands, we're not even their top priority. Those people are the top priority for the leaders at Southwest. Their leaders truly love the employees and they work very, very hard to serve them. Most of the best examples of this come from the former uh, CEO and chairman, his name is Herb Kelleher. And there are just story after story I could tell you about him, so I'll keep it to just a few. But Herb was known for consistently doing things like, for one, he would never pass up a team member, almost never, without giving that person a hug. If it was a female team member, oftentimes it was a kiss sometimes actually on the mouth. As a side note, I highly recommend you don't do any of that. that is a, your HR department will not like you. It's not appropriate. But you know, I've actually spoken to probably five or six flight attendants in Southwest who were around during the Herb Kelleher days, and I asked them, who, who actually got a kiss from Herb, and I asked them, what did you think of that? Did it bother you? None of them said that it bothered them. They said, you know, it wasn't like some dirty old man trying to you know, Mac on a young flight attendant, it was more like a father figure who just loved you so much that he couldn't pass you by without giving you a hug or a kiss. But now Herb was also doing things, and I, I use the word old man loosely. He was, he was fairly old towards the end of his career, but he also smoked like a chimney, drank, he was pretty frail. And despite these things, he was known also for consistently doing things like coming in on Thanksgiving Day to work side by side with frontline people like baggage handlers 
throwing 50 pound suitcases onto airplanes for a few hours. This is a guy running a company of 30,000 plus employees. Herb believed that the best way to lead any team is to lead with love. The best way to lead any organization is to lead with love. Southwest calls themselves the airline that love built, and I don't think they're talking about love field. That's just a nice coincidence. You can even see the heart in their logo. And for all of, this, all of those of us who raised our hands as being fans, you probably noticed on their airplanes, the new logo is nothing but a heart. Now, from a business standpoint, just maybe by head nods or something, do you all think that they've been successful uh, with this kind of fuzzy formula of leading with love? Yes. In fact, I think I could make a pretty good argument that relative to their industry, they're the most successful company in US history. Up until about five or six years or so ago, the airline industry was so cutthroat that most airlines were very, very happy if they could have one profitable year every three or four years. Southwest has been profitable every single year since 1969 or 70, one of their, right after their first year of operation. They typically have costs that are half of the industry average. And during much of Herb Kelleher's time, when they were in their, their real, their peak, their heyday, the market cap of Southwest was typically around two to three times the rest of their major competitors combined. So I think we can go ahead and chalk that up as at least one victory, right, for, organiz for this demonstration of how effective we can be as an organization when we put taking care of our, our team members as a top priority. Um, I'd like to share one other case study for you or with you. That's, this, is, this one's pretty well known, but this case study I almost can guarantee none of you have ever heard of unless you've already read Serve to be Great somehow today since you got the book. But it's a company called Next Jump. Uh, they're based in New York. I get so excited talking about these guys, I'm going to have to hydrate a little bit first. Feel free to join me if you like. Um, mine's not alcoholic, but I won't judge you if you're an early starter. So this is a picture of uh, Charlie Kim, who's the co-founder and current co-CEO. And at Next Jump, you know, they're, one of the things that really drives their culture is they're always looking for ways to make the lives of the people that work for them better, both in the workplace and at home. And they're continuously asking in a formal way, what can we do to help you be happier? But even more than that, or, I, or maybe and even more than that, I should say, is they are building an entire culture. They, at this point, they probably have a little bit over four, uh, 400 employees worldwide. They're building an entire culture from the top leadership down to the most frontline person of people who are all more focused on serving and taking care of the people around them than they are on their own short-term self-interest. And perhaps the best evidence of how important this is to the leadership at, South, or at uh, Next Jump is an award they have called the Avenger Award. It's appropriately named. I think that a lot of their team members are just like superheroes. But this award is a $30,000 package. It includes a third week of paid vacation on a beautiful island in the Caribbean. And this award does not go to the top marketing person, doesn't go to the top salesperson, doesn't go to the top programmer, they're a, they're a tech company. This award has absolutely nothing to do with revenue. The award goes to the number one peer voted most selfless, helpful person in the company. It goes to the best servant leader, so to speak. And I was at the Avenger Award Ceremony a few years ago in New York. I got to see this young man named Gauri be announced as the winner. Uh, he kind of looks like he should win, doesn't he? <laughs> this is one of the nicest people I've ever met. And when he was announced as the winner, you know, there was a room full of about 250, 300 people, most of them his peers. And you might expect when somebody's announced as the winner of a $30,000 package that there might be a little bit of jealousy or maybe even some animosity, you know, like, oh, he didn't, she shouldn't have got it, she should have, or something like that. That did not happen. I, I turned around, I noticed that he was receiving a standing ovation, uh, and I, I looked at the eyes of the people in the room, almost everyone had tears in their eyes, because it was so inspiring to see a human being at a for-profit company being honored in this way for simply serving the people around them. And the audience included his parents, who were flown in from India to see him receive the honor. Mom looks pretty proud there, doesn't she? That is one proud mama. 
Now, what do you suppose happens when you build a culture like this? You know, I, I, perhaps most obvious is you get teams that work a whole lot better as teams, right? You get people talking, the language is we, right? How are we going to do this? How are we going to solve this problem? How are we going to reach this lofty goal? Not me, not I. But perhaps more subtle is you, you tend to get the best people in your industry. I, in Next Jump's case, perhaps the best people in the world working at your organization. They're fully engaged while they're with you, and they don't want to leave. So here are a couple of very specific examples for you, business examples. In 2012, Next Jump had almost 18,000 people apply for 35 open positions. That is a higher rate of 0.2%. To put that in perspective, the admission rate to Harvard that year was six. So it was 30 times easier to get into Harvard than it was to get a job at Next Jump. Now, what makes this a little bit more remarkable is raise your hand if you've ever even heard of Next Jump. Nobody. This is not Google we're talking about, right? Google, I think, has put, what, a 1% higher rate, something like that? But you can't look on the internet without seeing Google, and you know you have the bring your dog to work and the foosball tables. Google's great, everybody knows that. None of you have ever heard of Next Jump. I spoke in New York City in June for a group of people that were three blocks away from their headquarters. None of them had heard of Next Jump. How does a company that nobody has ever heard of get 18,000 applications for 35 open positions? That's what a culture like this can do. The people there are so engaged that just a, a couple years prior to that, when, before I met Charlie, they had a couple team members ask if they could have some bedrooms put in the New York City office. And it, because they said, you know, oftentimes we're so passionate about what we're working on and who we're working with, and we want to stay late. And Charlie and other leaders said, no way. People are going to sue us for running a sweatshop or something, right, if we have bedrooms in the office. But the employees made a very good argument. They said, look, we, we want to stay late often, but in New York, much like probably in Chicago, people who commute on the L, you know, if, you're, if you want to stay late there, then what that means is you take an hour back and forth on the subway, you lose two hours of sleep. Um, and if they had a bed in the office, what that meant is you could eliminate that commute. They had a gym there in the office. They ha always had, much like Google and the other tech companies, they always had the free healthy food out that you can eat. They said, what's the problem? And so management acquiesced. And there are now actually two bedrooms in the New York City office. Can you imagine a for-profit company where team members are ask, voluntarily asking to have sleepovers in the office? It's actually happening. And their ability to retain those team members is also pretty remarkable. So in the tech space, every year, voluntary turnover averages around 20%. Um, the year I researched it for Serve to be Great, I think it was 22. So roughly one in five people, talented people, are leaving voluntarily every year. Um, is any, any of you aware of what that costs you um, in, a, in very precise terms? I know we, kinda, we all know that's not good, right? Most HR professionals estimate that for a mid-level employee that you would like to have on your team, that losing that person costs you a year's salary. If you start getting up into higher management, it can be a two to three times annual salary. So now, if you're, it doesn't take a mathematician to realize if your turnover is 20% or in some industries 30 and 40%, that is a huge hit on productivity and specifically on the bottom line. So you might think, OK, Next Jump has this great culture, uh, and the industry average is 20% turnover. Maybe theirs is only 15, or maybe it's even 10. In most years, their turnover is around 1%. And that is despite the fact that their employees are oftentimes getting calls from other companies in the tech space trying to get them out of Next Jump to come work for them because it's a very, very competitive. Programmers are really hard to come by. They're offering them sometimes two to three times their annual salary. And most of the times, the employees don't even return the phone calls. They're, they're totally happy where they are. And what, one last benefit I'd like to share. I mean, there, there are many others. But just to keep this short and to try to make it as hyper-focused, I think, on what's relevant uh, to the procurement industry. So I know innovation is a huge topic right now. Uh, this, I think, is one of the most, if not the most, important factors of creating a culture of innovation in a team. Because the two biggest blocks to innovation, other than not having the right people on your team, are bureaucracy 
red tape and fear. And if we're a leader who truly cares about our team members and we really want to serve them, what's one of the first things we would want to get rid of? Red tape, right? Red tape is just, it's, these are essentially just roadblocks to people getting things done, right? So we become allergic to it. The second thing, fear, this is, you cannot innovate in, an, in a workplace where fear exists. Why? Because innovation almost never happens in a vacuum. There are some unicorn examples like Apple. I mean, Steve Jobs just sat around and thought stuff up and said 20 years from now everyone's going to buy this, and he was right. That happens sometimes, but almost never. In almost every case, innovation is a result of doing something, getting real-world feedback from customers, whether internal or external, failing, iterating, trying again, and oftentimes with multiple pivots with each iteration, oftentimes innovations end up being something, solving a completely different problem that you started off trying to solve. Does anyone use Slack? Has anyone ever heard of Slack? The people who created Slack <laughs> did not want to create Slack. They had a whole other startup they were working on. They created Slack for themselves internally. It was awesome. They shared it with some people. Now they're Slack. Like, that's not how they started off. But they never would have got to Slack if they didn't start doing something and risk failure. And people on a team are never going to take the chance to risk failure, to express an idea that challenges the status quo, which is the first step, and then have time and the ambition to work on it without fear of, of being reprimanded if it fails. Because you're, you're going to fail. By definition, you should actually have failure as a goal if you want to innovate. How many times can you fail and how quickly? Because the more quickly you get to failure, the, the sooner you're going to get to the solution that uh, results in value for the end consumer.